when the music fades, all is stripped away, and I simply come, longing just to bring something that's of worth, that will touch your heart. I'll bring you more than a song, for a song in itself is not what you have required. You search much deeper within, through the way things appear, you're looking into my heart. I'm coming back to the heart of worship, and it's all about you, all about you, Jesus. I'm sorry, Lord, for the thing I've made it, when it's all about you, all about you, Jesus. King of endless worth, no one could express how much you deserve. Though I'm weak and poor, all I have is yours, every single breath. I'll bring you more than a song, for a song in itself is not what you have required. You search much deeper within, through the way things appear, you're looking into my heart. I'm coming back to the heart of worship, and it's all about you, all about you, Jesus. I'm sorry, Lord, for the thing I've made it, when it's all about you, all about you. I'm coming back to the heart of worship, and it's all about you, all about you, Jesus. I'm sorry, Lord, for the thing I've made it, when it's all about you, all about you, Jesus. This is the day the Lord has made. Let us, Let us rejoice and be glad in it. May the peace of Christ be with you. And also with you. Would you please stand and join me as you're able in our call to worship. Good morning. Good morning. Christ's love is poured out for us like water poured into a basin. Christ's love washes us. Christ's love shows us who we are to be and what we are to do. How blessed we are to such love. How blessed indeed. Please remain standing for our opening hymn, God Whose Giving Knows No Ending. We'll be singing all verses.
Please pray with me. King of all the earth, creator of the universe, holy tribune God, from everlasting to everlasting, you are Lord. You are merciful and full of loving kindness and great compassion. We will rejoice for your grace, our Lord, has overflowed for us. You have washed us thoroughly from our wickedness and cleansed us from our sin. We will rejoice for your grace, O Lord, has overflowed for us. Against you alone have we sinned, and to you alone do we look for restoration. We will rejoice for your grace, O Lord, has overflowed for us, who is like our God, the one who takes away the iniquity of his people, the one who gives them clean hearts and right spirits. We will rejoice for your grace, O Lord, has overflowed for us. This is our God, the Holy One. Come before him with thanksgiving and offer him the sacrifice of praise as we say the prayer that he taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors, and lead us not to temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. these gifts, O oh God, with joy and thanks. May they strengthen your church for acts of love and service. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. You may be seated. Our first reading today is Psalms 5, 50, excuse me, is Psalms 51, verses 7 through 12. Purge me with hyssop, and I shall be clean. Wash me, and I shall be whiter than snow. Let me hear joy and gladness. Let the bones that, have, that you have crushed rejoice. Hide your face from my sins and blot out all my iniquities. Create in me a clean heart, O God, and put a new and right spirit within me. Do not cast me away from your presence, and do not take your Holy Spirit from me. Restore to me the joy of your salvation, and sustain me in me a willing spirit. This ends the first reading. We come to a time of prayer, and prayer is not just lifting up those that are in need of something, but and also it is to lift up uh, thanksgiving and praise to God. And we, um, so we, we start with celebrations. Um, uh, this past week, I got to participate in a uh, uh, in a ecumenical service of prayer for Ukraine, and it, it was a wonderful experience. The planning process, the uh, the fellowship with 
other faith traditions and uh, uh, denominations that were present. Uh, it was just a wonderful thing. We met at St. Andrew's Episcopal Church, and uh, there were over 100 people in the room. It was, just, it was a, just a wonderful experience to be a part of, but also a humbling experience as we, uh, you know, we think about those things that are happening in the world that uh, we kind of take for granted here. But it's those kinds of things that affect us all. Uh, e even in the slightest bit, we're all affected by what's going on in Eastern Europe. Um, so we thank God for those opportunities that present themselves. Are there any other celebrations that we have? Okay, I'm the only celebration. Okay. On a more serious note, we, we do lift up those that uh, are in need of, of those extra measures of, of healing and peace and hope as we think of those in Ukraine. Uh, we, uh, you know, we do celebrate John uh, Wood being back home, uh, but we still pray and lift him up as he uh, still is recovering and going through the, the treatments and, and everything. And uh, uh, so, uh, you know, it's kind of a, a mixed blessing in, it, in that. Um, we lift up John Atterbury as he is still struggling with, with uh, his health and uh, his walking and, and all of that. Uh, uh, it's spring break. We lift up all those that are traveling. Uh, the students, the, uh, uh, the parents that now have to uh, host their children one more time for, you know, for an extra week. You know. They were just home, weren't they? They were just home. But we, do, yes, but we do lift them up and ask for, for safety, for not only travel, but for their, for their week, uh, for responsible decisions. And, uh, you know, we, as, as parents and those who care for the children of this world, that, that means a lot to us to uh, to keep them in our prayers. Are there any others that go named this morning? Okay. We do remember those that go unnamed in our own minds and hearts, but also so many others that go unknown to us. We take 10 seconds before we join together in our unified prayer of confession to lift those names up in silence. Let us pray. Would you please join me in our unified prayer of confession as printed in your bulletin. God of service and abundance, on this day we are reminded that we ought to love and serve one another. We confess that your ways are not always our ways. When we drift toward isolation and indifference, may we remember this act of submission and your ever new commandment of love. May our love and service be signs of hope for the world. Amen. The Lord has heard our voices and our supplications. God has loosed our bonds. Know that when we fall short, God hears our prayers and frees us for lives of gratitude and service. In Christ, we are forgiven.
Have any of you ever tried a fried blooming onion? Oh, I love them. I love them. But they get me in so much trouble. They taste great. If, if you haven't had one, they, they cut open this sweet Vidalia onion and uh, they dip it in batter and they deep fry. I mean, uh, yeah, that already sounds good, don't it? And all the layers, they spread out. And you're probably wondering why I'm talking about onions and making everyone hungry this morning. I do that because onions have layers. And the story that we are looking at today has layers as well. Layers of understanding and of truth that are revealed in each layer. Our scripture this morning comes from John chapter 13 verses 1 to 17. Listen for the word of the Lord. Now before the festival of the Passover, Jesus knew that his hour had come to depart from this world and go to the Father. Having loved his own who were in the world, he loved them to the end. The devil had already put it into the heart of Judas, son of Simon Iscariot, to betray him. And during supper, Jesus, knowing that the Father had given all things into his hands and that he had come from God and was going to God, got up from the table, took off his outer robe, and tied a towel around himself. Then he poured water into a basin and began to wash the disciples' feet and to wipe them with the towel that was tied around him. He came to Simon Peter, who said to him, Lord, are you going to wash my feet? Jesus answered, You do not know now what I am doing, but later you will understand. Peter said to him, you will never wash my feet. And Jesus answered, unless I wash you, you have no share with me. Simon Peter said to him, Lord, not my feet only, but also my hands and my head. Jesus said to him, one who has bathed does not need to wash except for the feet, but is entirely clean. And you are clean, though not all of you, for he knew who was to betray him. For this reason, he said, not all of you are clean. After he had washed their feet, had put on his robe and had returned to the table, he said to them, do you know what I have done to you? You call me teacher and Lord, and you are right, for that is what I am. So if I, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you also ought to wash one another's feet. For I have set you an example that you also should do as I have done to you. Very truly, I tell you, servants are not greater than their master, nor are messengers greater than the one who sent them. If you know these things, you are blessed if you do them. This is the word of the Lord. Layer one of that sweet, deep fried Vidalia onion. A simple truth. How much Jesus loves you. John is the only gospel writer to share with us this story of Jesus washing the apostles' feet. Now, it takes place on Thursday night of the Holy Week, what we call Maundy Thursday. The 12 apostles and Jesus are going to share the Passover meal together. We're told in Luke 22 that how the preparations were made for this very significant meal in the Jewish faith as they remember the miracle of God delivering his people from the Egyptians. John 13 verse 2 here says that during supper, then we have lots of footnotes of what was going on. And finally in verse 4, John finishes the sentence. He, Jesus, got up from the table, took off his outer robe. There was something that normally happened when you entered a Jewish person's home at this time in history that didn't happen here. A servant would wash people's feet. This did not happen here because they were in a borrowed room. Some people, such as I, call it that upper room. Since none of the apostles were in the role of house servant, the text doesn't say if they felt themselves above this task or not. Jesus sets the example and he washes the feet of his apostles. Now in that story in Luke, Jesus was in the home of Simon the Pharisee. Simon failed to give to Jesus the common courtesy of having Jesus' feet washed. But a woman, according to the NRSV adds, who was a, who was a sinner came into his home and washed Jesus' feet with her tears and dried them with her hair as an act of worship. Why then did Jesus wash his disciples' feet? Well, first, he was following Jewish custom. That's pretty simple. Second, people's feet get dirty and smelly. And it's good hygiene to have good feet when eating. 
Jewish customs for eating around a table were different than ours, and much of what we read in the New Testament was common in Roman customs as well. Instead of sitting at a table with chairs as we do, the custom then, uh, as I understand it, was to recline on pillows with your head and hands near the table and your feet extended out, away from it. This way, Jesus could easily reach or had access to the feet of the disciples. Now, according to that famous painting by Da Vinci, it shows Jesus and his disciples sitting at a table, much like a sitcom would have everybody seated around so they're all facing the camera, you know. As wonderful as that painting is, it's inaccurate. Third, the more important reason Jesus washed his disciples' feet was to show how much he loved them. In verse 1, John shares with us that Jesus wanted to show the full extent of his love to the apostles. Most translations, including what we read today, have he loved them to the end. Does that mean love them to the end of his earthly life or to the end of eternity or to what end? The Greek word translated here, end, can also be translated complete or fully. I like the 1978 NIV emphasizing how he loved them to the full extent of his love. From all we can tell, Jesus spent almost every moment of about three years with these 12 men. He knew their strengths, he knew their faults, and yet he loved them completely. And Jesus also loves you and me, even with our warts, our shattered dreams, our brokenness. I call this first layer of the onion illustration a simple truth, how much Jesus loved them. It was love not in words, but in action. This is how we ought to love Jesus as well. Jesus loves these disciples so much that he humbled himself to wash their feet. So how do you show the full extent of your love to others? Do you wash dishes? Do you rake leaves? Do you do it some other way? How do you show the full extent of your love to Jesus? Do you witness to someone about your faith? Do you go on a mission trip? Do you do something else? We're through the first layer and down to the second layer. I was originally drawn to this passage because of the conversation that's had between Jesus and Peter. I wanted to understand the deeper meaning of what was being said here, and I have learned that and so much more. If y'all have ever gotten the chance to delve into about 30 different commentaries, oh, you'll learn so much more than what you really wanted to. The verse 6 here begins, he came to Simon Peter. So as Jesus is washing the feet of the, uh, of the disciples, he comes to Peter in that rotation. One scholar speculated that John was the first to have his feet washed, and then John allowed it as an act of Jesus loving him, and his love for Jesus flowed back. And remember that John, in, in the gospel, refers to himself six times as the disciple whom Jesus loved. However, when he gets to rough and tough Peter... He's not into touchy and feely things, apparently. Peter's question is on the edge of being a rebuke. Lord, are you really going to wash my feet? And Jesus explains that he did not understand what Jesus was doing, but he would later. Even though Peter didn't understand it now, he refused to allow Jesus to humble himself into that servant role and wash his feet. And then verse 8 gives us the strong words of Peter, you shall never wash my feet. Now, our English language has trouble giving the full impact of the Greek in that verse. So I'll read from the Berkeley translation, which is probably as close as it will get in the English. You shall never, ever touch my feet. I've heard some churches have taken foot washing and they've made it an ordinance as such as we do for baptism and Lord's Supper. They have a foot washing service on a regular basis and that's fine if they want to do that, but I don't see Jesus here instructing us to make it an ordinance. Twice I have participated in a foot washing service, first as an elder in my former church before I answered the call to pastoral ministry I was first washed by my pastor and then handed a towel and then took my place in front of a chair where a group of people eventually came forward and allowed me to wash their feet the second time I was an associate minister there but the experience was pretty much the same now I felt more comfortable doing the washing than receiving it however it was a meaningful experience either way because there's humility in doing the washing 
but another kind of humility in receiving the washing. Because of that experience, I can understand Peter's uncomfortableness with Jesus washing his feet. However, there is more here than meets the eye. The reply of Jesus here in verse 8 moves this experience into a mutual fellowship. Unless I wash you, you have no share with me. Jesus is telling Peter that if he didn't let him wash his feet, you have no part or any share with me. There's no fellowship. And when Jesus raised that bar and made this foot washing about fellowship and relationship, Peter changed his attitude pretty quickly. Peter wanted that relationship with Jesus to be all that it could be. So he he responds to Jesus finally in verse 9. Lord, not my feet only, but also my hands and my head. Essentially, God, Jesus, wash all of me if that's what it means to be closer to you. Don't you love that passion? So when you came to church this morning, did you come with a mindset of, I'm going to give Jesus a couple of hours of my time, but that's all? You're giving to Jesus a little bit of yourself. And I'm moved by Peter's heart for Jesus, not just my feet, but wash all of me. And I urge you today to give Jesus all of yourself in this worship service. Is there any area of your life that you're holding back on Jesus? Give it to him. Let him have all of you. We're down to the third layer. And see uh, another layer of truth that's presented here verses 12 to 17 I read again after he had washed their feet had put on his robe and had returned to the table he said to them do you know what I have done to you you call me teacher and lord and you are right for that is what I am so if I your lord and teacher have washed your feet you also ought to wash one another's feet for I have set you an example that you also should do as I have done to you Very truly, I tell you, servants are not greater than their master, nor are messengers greater than the one who sent them. If you know these things, you are blessed if you do them. After Jesus washes his disciples' feet, he explains to them why he did it. Although the leader of the group, Jesus set the example by serving. We should look for ways to serve people in our church family, but also in our community. Most of us would nod our heads in agreement with that, and that would be a good thing for us to do, to serve one another. However, do we really make the time to do it? Do we make a full effort? We're blessed that we also have Luke's gospel account because it gives another dimension on this teaching and foot washing. In uh, Luke 13, verse 24 to 27, it says, "A A dispute also arose among them as to which one of them was to be regarded as the greatest. But he said to them, The kings of the Gentiles lorded over them, and those in authority over them are called benefactors. But not so with you. Rather, the greatest among you must become like the youngest, and the leader like one who serves. For who is greater, the one who is at the table or the one who serves? Is it not the one at the table? But I am among you as one who serves." The apostles of Jesus in Luke's account had been arguing among themselves which one would be the greatest when Jesus sets up his kingdom. They were confused and they still didn't understand that Jesus wasn't going to lead a revolution against the Romans and set up a political kingdom. Jesus knew that they had this argument and that these disciples' hearts and attitudes were probably still on that subject while they were eating that Passover meal that evening. What did Jesus see when he looked across that room? He saw proud hearts, and he saw dirty feet. And by washing their feet, Jesus showed them humility. Earthly kingdoms are all about title and position, but the kingdom of God is about humble service. Those who are the greatest in the kingdom of God are those who serve rather than those who have the highest position of honor. These apostles were unwilling to humble themselves and wash each other's feet, but Jesus was willing to do it. So is there someone at your workplace or a neighbor or even here in the church who you should humble yourself to serve in some way? John 13, 17 teaches us what will happen to us if we do the things of God. 
four simple words, you will be blessed. The fourth layer. Let's pull back the layer of that onion one last time here. I want to come back to that statement of Jesus in verse 7 that Peter didn't understand what Jesus was doing then, but later he would. And what was it that Peter came to understand later? Beyond receiving the full extent of God's love, beyond the humility of serving one another, beyond the sharing apart uh, with Jesus in fellowship and relationship, Peter came to understand the humility of Jesus would go even deeper than washing feet. Jesus humbled himself to die on the cross for the sins of the world. And Peter finally got it. We hear Peter on the day of Pentecost preaching that truth. This Jesus God raised up, and of that all of us are witnesses, being therefore exalted at the right hand of God, and having received from the Father the promises of the Holy Spirit, he has poured out this that you both see and hear. So what was it that Peter came to understand in that upper room? A humble leader teaching his disciples to serve one another. And by the time of Pentecost, who did Peter see Jesus become? One who was exalted to the right hand of God. Rather than kneeling and serving, Jesus had been exalted. And further on, a few uh, verses later, Peter said, One whom the Lord made Lord and Messiah, the humble teacher, revealed his glory in the resurrection, and now Peter could boldly proclaim Jesus as Lord and Savior. Peter thought he knew all about Jesus. But there was so much more to learn and to understand. May God help each of us grow in our awareness of Jesus' glory. Let me close with a story. Questions about God's existence troubled a gentleman by the name of H.A. Hodges. He was a brilliant young professor at Oxford University. He was a professor of philosophy and had studied all the great philosophers and world religions but he couldn't commit himself to any one of them. And one day as he was strolling down the street, he passed by an art store. His attention was gripped by a simple picture in the window and it showed Jesus kneeling to wash his disciples' feet. He had read the Bible as a textbook and was familiar with the story. And suddenly the sheer meaning of the scene gripped his heart. God, the God who created the universe, had come to earth, humbled himself to do the lowliest of tasks. And if God was like that, then God shall be my God. He surrendered his heart and his life to follow the foot washing God. So what about you? Do you follow the God who's willing to humble himself to wash disciples' feet? Do as Peter did. Let him wash all of you in a complete surrender of yourself to him in all his ways. Amen. As we prepare to come to communion, we bring all of ourselves to that moment, just as Christ brought all of himself to that moment in order that we may share in the life, the death, the resurrection, and eternal life in Christ. Please join with me as we sing our communion hymn.
as we prepare to take communion. For those of you who are watching at home, now would be a great time to gather your elements together as we prepare to take bread and cup. And remember when we do so, to open the wafer side first before turning it over and opening the juice side. Let us pray. Dear Lord, we rejoice in gathering together here today to worship you and to remember you. And in this time of Lent, we reflect on the sacrifices and the forgivenesses that you have given us. We will remember that you have saved us all when you hung on the cross. Let us go out into the world and do God's work. Amen. So on that last night in that upper room, Jesus with his disciples took bread and blessing it, he broke it. And he told his disciples to take and eat. This is my body broken for you. When you eat of this bread, remember me. And so we eat. In the same manner after supper, Jesus took a cup. He, he told his disciples that this is the new covenant in my blood poured out for the forgiveness of sin. When you drink of this cup, all of you, remember me. And so we drink. For as often as we eat this bread and drink this cup, we proclaim the Lord's death, his resurrection, eternal life in and through our God. These are the gifts of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. We come to a moment of invitation. It's a trifold invitation. One, that if you have come to that moment where you have declared Jesus as Lord and Savior, we, we welcome you to, to make that a public uh, announcement. The second is we invite you, if you have felt that this is a faith community to be a part of, we encourage you to, to make that a public announcement as well. And the third invitation, if you just choose to come forward and say an encouraging word or even a word of criticism, we welcome you to do that as well. Please join me in standing and singing our hymn of invitation. few announcements before we, we get out of here today. Um, uh, today at 6 o'clock, uh, elders, there is a Zoom meeting, uh, elder meeting uh, this evening. So if you haven't received the uh, uh, 
the Zoom uh, link for that, please contact either me or Andy uh, or, uh, or, well, any of the other elders. So, we, we, so one of us will have it. Uh, also, next Sunday, there's a board meeting right after church service. Uh, so if you're on the board, be there or, or, or not be there. Uh, so be there right after service next Sunday if you're on the board. Um, uh, let's see. We got an Easter egg hunt that's being planned for the 8th, 9th, I keep saying 8th, the 9th of April. Uh, so we are asking people to, to bring in eggs and uh, candy uh, little treats that go inside the eggs. They can be little toys too. Um, and at some point we're going to, to get together and, and uh, do an egg stuffing day. Uh, boy, that sounds wonderful. I like stuffed eggs. Um, if you can't tell that already. Um, but uh, we'll be doing that. And so uh, we're, we're looking probably around noon on that Saturday to do that over in Dishman Park. So um, uh, if you have any other, uh, if you need more information, get with Karen Townsend and, uh, and she'll, she'll set you up. Um, let's see, anything else that's pressing at the moment? Any other announcements? Hmm? Oh, Craft Corner. Yeah, uh, our first Craft Corner will be this Thursday here at the church. It's going to be from 10 to noon. So uh, it, it's uh, a very um, inexpensive uh, time of, uh, to be together to do little crafts, not only for ourselves, but for our community as well. Uh, and you're going to be doing feely hearts, is that? Okay, okay. Uh, if you could get with Karen, if you plan on coming, that way she can have enough uh, feely heart kits for that. Feely hearts are very similar to those bears that y'all have done, except they're little bitty ones that uh, they allow uh, patients who have been in surgery to, uh, to hold in their hand after surgery. They, they kind of put it in their hand after the surgery and stuff. So uh, that's what those are. They're just little stuffed hearts that uh, are made with love. So, choir practice on Wednesday nights at 6.30. Uh, Sunday school at uh, 9.30 on Sunday mornings. Um, uh, prayer at 9 o'clock, is that right? And, uh, and then on Saturday mornings at 9, uh, we have men's group. So I didn't hear anybody speak up about a women's group meeting this week. So, okay, nothing there. Anything else? Boy, that's a lot. Oh. Well, yeah, you'll, uh, you'll see that come together throughout the, uh, the rest of Lent. So it's all part of the, the transformative process as we move through the book of John. So. Well, join me in our, our commissioning here in the back of the bulletin. Go forth into the world to serve God with gladness. Be of good courage. Hold fast to that which is good. Render to no one evil for evil. Strengthen the faint-hearted. Support the weak. Help the afflicted. Honor all people. Love and serve God, rejoicing in the power of the Holy Spirit. Jesus told his disciples, A new commandment I give you, to love one another. So you must love one another. By this, everyone will know that you are my disciples if you love one another. Go in peace, then loving one another and loving the world that God so loved. Amen.